Good evening, good morning, and a warm welcome to all for today's webinar hosted by Vishishraya Industrial and Technological Museum in partnership with U.S. Consulate General, Chennai. Museums have the power to inspire and educate millions of students every year. Vishishraya Industrial and Technological Museum, the southern headquarters of National Council of Science Museums, under the purview of Ministry of Culture, Government of India, attracts more than a million visitors every year. Every year, May 18th is observed as International Museum Day to bring awareness among people about the museums. The museums across the globe are having a challenging time due to the pandemic. Digital technologies offer enormous opportunities to engage and inspire the public. The theme of this year's International Museum Day is the future of museums recover and reimagine. Today, we have an eminent personality from the world's largest museum and research complex, the Smithsonian. We are privileged to have with us Ms. Rachel Gosling, the director of the Art and Industries Building, Smithsonian. On behalf of Vishwasha Industrial and Technological Museum and U.S. Consulate General, I extend a warm welcome to you, Ms. Rachel Gosling. We are privileged to have you with us for today's evening. Thank you very much for having come over here in spite of your busy schedule. This event would not have been possible but for the constant effort of the team at the U.S. Consulate General Chennai, in particular, Ms. Brinda Jayakanth. I extend a warm welcome to the entire team of U.S. Consulate General Chennai. We have a lot of museum professionals, students, teachers, academicians who have joined us for this talk. A warm welcome to all of you. Last but not the least, I would like to welcome my colleagues from Visheshwar Industrial and Technological Museum and National Council of Science Museums who have joined us for today's talk. Welcome one and all. Now let me introduce the speaker of the day. Ms. Rachel Goslins brings over 25 years of diverse experience in the creative industries, social impact, law, and public policy to the position. Rachel served as executive director of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities and Advisory Committee to the White House on Cultural Policy from 2009 until late 2015. She also served as the director of the Independent Digital Distribution Lab, a joint PBS ITVS project. She is a 2012 Henry Crown Fellow of Aspen Institute. Currently, she is a director of Arts and Industries Building. Before the talk, I would like to make an announcement. I would request all the participants to please mute your audio and video during the talk. You can ask your question at the end of the talk by typing in your questions in the chat box. Over to you, Ms. Rachel, the stage is yours. Thank you so much and um, happy International Museums Day, everyone. It's a very fitting day to be connecting with you all. And I'm really excited to share with you um, some thoughts uh, uh, from the perspective of the Smithsonian and a preview of our upcoming exhibition, uh, which is fittingly about the future. Um, all right, hold on. So can you all see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, can I... see your screen. Yeah, we can yeah, see your screen. Perfect. So excited. Thank you so much. Um, uh, all righty. So um, I'm going to, I think, go off video so that I don't distract you all. Um, Hold on, let me see how I can do that. Um, all right, 
never mind. Uh, okay, so uh, as I said, um, Smithsonian and the exhibition that I'm going to talk to you about today, Futures, is the cornerstone of our um, 175th anniversary. Um, oops, let's see. Um, I was talking a little bit about our reach, breadth, and depth, and depth across all of our museums, as well as our um, objects, our research projects, our publications. We had, uh, we reached about half a billion people digitally last year. Um, uh, actually, it's 2019 prior to COVID. That number has gone up a lot since then. And we had about 22 million unique visitors visit our museums um, across uh, the National Mall and our other museums in other cities. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about the Arts and Industries building. This beautiful building at the bottom here is the building that I'm fortunate to be the director of. Um, it was our first museum. So it's our second Smithsonian building, but uh, our first building is literally a castle and it was our kind of administrative center. And in, 19, in 1879, the Smithsonian decided, made a decision that many of your organizations have made to um, tell stories, to turn outwards, to become uh, a museum. And uh, they built this building um, modeled after the great world's fairs of the 19th century. Um, this crazy pavilions, one of its many nicknames is the brick tent, uh, which I particularly like because it seems like a circus tent in brick. And uh, over the course of 145 years, this building has showcased um, really all of the marvels of the universe uh, and the big ideas that were about to change the world uh, for uh, American and international visitors. Um, we had everything from buffaloes to uh, the Star Spangled Banner to rocket ships. Um, this museum and building incubated almost all of our other Smithsonian museums starting to show those collections. And then as the collections grew, um, uh, they would be moved into uh, their own museum. So um, we had a huge natural history collection and then we built the Museum of Natural History. Um, we had lots of rocket ships and airplanes and flying things. And then we built the Museum of Air and Space. Um, it's always been a place where we talk to our, the public about the future, where we talk about these big ideas that are gonna change the world. One of my favorite pictures is, um, is this one in November of 1969. Um, we exhibited in the rotunda of the Arts and Industries building a rock from the moon. And it's really amazing um, for those of us who are in museum practice to think of now, you know, we landed on the moon in July, in late July of 1969. And less than three months later, we had a rock from that lunar expedition in the center of the Arts and Industries building where everybody could see and get close to this piece of transformative history. Um, you know, if you think about now how long it would take to get the rock, <laughs> to accession it, to conserve it, to curate it, and to turn it around for an exhibition, it would be like five years, but um, we did this all very quickly. So that's our glorious arts and industry building, and um, with, this with this building, we've um, been asked by the Smithsonian at large to um, stage a very large exhibition in November of this year talking to people about the future which is crazy when you think about it. How do you do an exhibition about the future? That's like saying do an exhibition about the past or the present, right? It's an almost impossible subject to distill and get your arms around. So that was our challenge. And um, how we decided to do that and how we approach it is something I wanna spend a little bit of time now on. Um, so we started with this quote by Carl Sagan. Um, the visions we offer our future, we, the, the visions we offer our children change the future. It matters what those visions are. Dreams are maps. And so when we think about why do an exhibition about the future, this is our starting point. If we can't imagine a future, we won't be able to get there. We need to understand the destination before we can understand the path. And um, and, and that's what we want this exhibition to do, is to help people understand the future and also see their own role in creating a path to that future. 
So started with a very deep premise. You know, it's very easy these days to do an exhibition about the future that feels very dark. There is a lot we as a society, we have a lot of help imagining what could go wrong in the future from media, from science fiction, from public intellectuals. And those are very important conversations. Those we call them dark mirror conversations are very important, but they're not the whole story and they can be overwhelming and they can leave, lead people to feeling paralyzed and hopeless and helpless. And so while we have a lot of help imagining what could go wrong, we don't have as much help imagining what could go right. And that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to create an exhibition that helps people imagine the future they want, not the future that they fear. And before we started, we did a tremendous amount of audience research and asked people, what do you think about the future? What do you think is going to happen? Um, what do you want to happen? And what we, um, we asked these very, we hired a fantastic international audience research firm and they did a national um, survey as well as small focus groups. And when we asked people, what do you want from the future? We thought we'd get a lot of, you know, flying cars and rocket ships and 3D printed food. But actually what we heard overwhelmingly is people wanted a future that was peaceful, that was just, that was sustainable, um, uh, uh, you know, and that worked for them. And um, and so we decided we made a fundamental decision at that point um, to really organize our exhibition, not around topics, but around values. Um, one of the things we did, we are a non-collecting uh, uh, museum within the Smithsonian. So we brought in all kinds of partners from the private sector, from academia, um, from technology, as well as pulling from um, uh, 12 of our sister museums and Smithsonian Research Centers to um, create an exhibition that was asset light that didn't rely on a central discipline or um, collection, but allowed us to be interdisciplinary and pull from the private sector uh, as well as our sister museums. We also wanted, um, we wanted to look across history. So you can't really understand the future until you understand the past. Um, so we have this eclectic um, uh, collection of objects that we are exhibiting and asking people to think about, look at the same topic from many different angles. So we have the original Bell Jetpack, which was developed uh, in the 1960s. And we have the Bell Nexus autonomous flying vehicle and the Hyperloop, um, uh, all these different ways of thinking about, for example, what transportation might look like in the future, um, starting with the past and, and moving forward. We wanted it to have a kind of festival feel. We wanted it to come from a place of curiosity as opposed to authority. You, you know, you if you're the Smithsonian or if you're any of your museums, you can decide what is important to tell people about any given subject. Um, you know, we can tell people everything they need to know about space flight or dinosaurs or, um, uh, or, you know, the history of 18th century pottery. You can't do that about the future. There is no authoritative guide to the future. So we really um, strove to create something that was curious and ask questions as much as it answered them. Um, we also wanted to use technology in interesting ways. Our central installation is um, a, a collaboration between Amazon and a fantastic Indian American uh, artist named Suchi Reddy, who is creating this monumental uh, sculpture of light and form and shape in our rotunda in which people can speak their hopes and fears for the future. And that will be visualized in a central column. Uh, of light and form. We're using holograms, we're using data visualization, um, we're using all kinds of different, we're experimenting and playing with different kinds of ways that technologies can um, help people be more human, can help them connect. Uh, and so, as I said before, the tendency when you're doing an exhibition about the future is to organize by topic, you know, future of travel, I mean, future of transportation, future of food, future of work. And we decided to um, organize it by values. What kind of future do we want to live in? 
Do we want to live in an inclusive future and a sustainable future, a successful future, a slow future, um, an efficient future? So our whole exhibition is designed around this concept of multiple futures and understanding that everybody's the future, everybody's future may be a little bit different. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I wanted to walk you quickly through the layout. Our, our museum is organized with these uh, four halls united by a central rotunda, and we have organized our content around these four themes, enter through past futures, and that's primarily historical objects, talking about how we have always been uh, in the business of future making, uh, probably since we invented fire. And then uh, you go into three different halls that are centered around themes of futures that work, futures that inspire, and futures that unite. I'm going to show you some images of some of these. Some of our, these are some of our design renderings. We're literally just starting fabrication this month. We're very excited. Um, but you can see we wanted to work with the architecture of the building and have something that felt um, not so much like a traditional museum exhibition, but something, um, you know, festival and a conference and an exhibition um, with lots of kinds of content. Um, we have several mottos along. One of them is anything that can move should move. We want it to be dynamic and kinetic, and we want to use art and technology and science and history uh, to help people think about the future. So each hall is organized with kind of a different visual approach and theme. Um, uh, we're using sustainable materials whenever possible. Um, you'll see in the corner or the, the, those blocks that you see sort of to the left, this is our Futures That Inspire Hall. They're made out of recycled movie, picture, movie posters. We have um, uh, in our uh, South Hall, which is um, uh, Futures That Work. A lot of our exhibit exhibitry is made out of mushroom bricks, which is a new kind of construction material that has a much lower environmental impact. So we're trying to tell stories with how we built the exhibition and how we're exhibiting the objects as well as um, with what we're saying. So that's where we are. And um, uh, we um, are, as I said, are object projected to open in the fall of 2021. Um, interestingly, we were, you know, maybe halfway into planning this exhibition when the pandemic hit. And so we really had to rethink uh, much about what we were doing here. We did feel that in many ways, now more than ever, a hopeful and curious exhibition about the future is important as we come out of this really challenging and hard time for so many people. Um, we had to revisit our visitor and staff safety protocols and think in new ways about cleaning and capacity. We changed some elements of our of our exhibition design to make it more open and make it so there weren't smaller rooms or smaller spaces that were gonna force people to closer contact. We moved from touchscreen technology to touchless technologies wherever possible, haptic and voice activated. Um, not entirely, there will still be touch screens in our, in our exhibition, but, uh, the, uh, emphasis on, um, on technologies that were touch free. Um, we're doing timed ticketing. The Smithsonian doesn't do ticketing and we're an entirely free, um, museum. Um, but for this, we are thinking about capacity and how to stagger that how to increase that over time. And we also looked at some of our, um, content. And we already had these themes in the exhibition, but given the events uh, uh, across the world and in America over the last year and a half, we added additional content around health and um, worked with the National Institute of Health to add something about vaccine development, as well as other ways that healthcare might change in the future, and also social justice. That was obviously has been a huge conversation um, uh, over the last year and a half and to make sure we were addressing what was on people's minds. More broadly at the Smithsonian, um, in response to this pandemic and um, as, as we think about, um, I know you guys are, uh, your country right now is, is, um, is really grappling with this. Um, you know, I don't think we did anything extraordinary and revolutionary. I'm sure we leaned into many of the same, same strategies that you are. 
one of the first thing we did was just recognize all of the parents and teachers um, who were at home and all the students who were learning from home. So our big first project was to offer a whole set of lessons and activities on our learning lab site for teachers running virtual classrooms and students lear running, learning from home. We did this very early on, which came out in late spring and got a huge response with hundreds of thousands of clicks and downloads um, as we launched these resources. We also shifted to music, virtual programming, um, as I'm sure many of you have, uh, talks, tours, performances, artist visits. We even held our annual galas and many of our annual conferences uh, virtually and had to kind of um, invent new ways to keep those fresh and engaging. And the last thing we did, which was really important um, in a world where there is so much information and so much confusion, so much polarization of the conversation is um, we created new materials on our, hosting them on our website and pushing them out through our communication channels um, with information on the pandemic. Uh, so information guides for kids that teach that parents could use to talk to their children about what was happening and then compiling COVID-19 resources. So research and um, uh, and and history and uh, scientific background uh, as a source for trusted information. We are we're operating in an environment where there is limited public trust right now of government and media and even universities. Everybody, um, uh, you know, can be skeptical. And the one place in our society that still has a huge amount of public trust is museums. People trust. What museums say. And so in times of crisis, I think as cultural institutions, we all have an in uh, a responsibility to step up and provide guidance and um, and uh, and information to people in a way that they can access it and we can build civic engagement and trust across our society. So I know I'm at the end of uh, my time here. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that anybody had or share anything else that I can um, uh, uh, with you all. And let me see yes. if I can yes. figure Thank out Thank you, Ms. Rachel Gosselin, for the taking, giving us an insight about the Futures exhibition uh, at the Smithsonian. Even in our museum, we tried to make uh, touchless operations for some of the exhibits, but it was not uh, possible to do for all. Mm. Now, all right. I think we'll take, uh, yeah, my colleague, Mr. Sajibas will moderate the question and answer session. Uh, we have got a few questions, ma'am. Am I audible? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, you're audible, yeah. yeah. Uh, one question is from uh, Mr. Pandarasan. How do we make uh, the museums more eco-friendly, committed to sustainability? That is such a good question and something that we really struggle with. I mean, um, uh, you have to walk your walk. Uh, and, and so there's really two answers to that. One is what messages are we sending um, to our visitors and what? how can we highlight exciting new ideas uh, in uh, sustainability? And the other is what are we doing ourselves? So we made a commitment to have a certain percentage of our exhibition be made out of renewable and sustainable materials. We put a big statement on our wall when you walk into our exhibition about sustainability and renewability and our commitment to both use best practices and highlight best practices across the museum field. Um, there's many things that we need to think about, you know, things like uh, what happens to our exhibitions when we break them down, you know, how much of what we build just gets thrown away at the end of the exhibition. How can you tell stories inside of an exhibition about how it was designed, how it was built, how it will be recycled? So we're spending a lot of time thinking about that. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. There is one more question. How can we use virtual museum in classroom teaching? Maybe virtual museums are not have uh, not come up in a big way in India. So that's why this question is. It's a great question, and um, uh, we are experimenting with that in in many ways. Um, uh, we um, 
uh, you know, we have uh, taken our uh, a huge portion of our um, collection and made it open access, so copyright free and rights free for anybody to use. Um, and that has been a huge boon to teachers as they think about building lesson plans. We've made as much of our content available as possible in 3D, so you can build it into animations and games and other other ways of using content to make it kind of come alive. Um, and so uh, uh, that is something that we're we're very excited about. And um, you know, virtual museum is I think we're just on the cusp. Of some really exciting innovation in that area. So there are some smaller museums and some all digital museums that have launched recent recently that are really experimenting with how do we use augmented reality, mixed reality, web browsers to, you know, not just show pictures of things, but to allow people to dive into content and to see other things. So I think we're going to be seeing in the next three to four years a huge leap in understanding of how to take our content and bring it into people's living rooms and classrooms uh, and uh, and lives. Uh, now that uh, the education is becoming online, maybe the museums will help that way. Yeah. Yeah. Here is another question. Uh, the online interactives are now playing an important role for communication museums during pandemic. Smaller museums don't have the technical competence and funding required to develop good quality digital interactives. Could you suggest uh, some alternatives? Yeah, I mean, I, that is a problem right across the board that smaller museums don't have sometimes the resources that the bigger museums, but I would say the smaller museums have something that I don't have as part of the Smithsonian, which is the ability to be nimble and the ability to try things and fail. You know, when we do anything, it's a huge project that has to go through seven committees and has a huge budget that to find and then has to go through reviews and it has to be deployed to 20 million people. And smaller museums can take one small thing, one, oh, we want to experiment with using this new technology on your phone and um, and they can do it quickly and they can do it um, much with many, much less resources because they can just do something that's just meant to be an experiment. Um, so I hear you. I think increasingly these tools will become cheaper and more widely available, but I also encourage you to lean into a smaller museum's ability to just try something and be nimble and be flexible in a way that big institutions can do. Yeah, there is another question here. What changes have been brought by pandemic to the museums, which may remain even after pandemic is over? Um, such a good question. Uh, and I'd be interested to hear from you all what you are feeling and seeing around this. I do think, um, our ability to reach people digitally has been exponentially expanded, and that will be uh, an advantage to us even when the world goes back to normal. You know, we built platforms, websites, increased our audiences. People look to us to be um, in their living rooms. And so I think that that will continue. I think, um, uh, I do think we may have an increased emphasis on health and um, uh, and some safety protocols around health that will just yeah. serve us even after this pandemic is um, is over. Um, and then I also think I don't know if you guys are dealing with this. I think there'll be a really a change in the way that we work internally. You yeah. know, I'm thinking yeah. as I think about bringing my staff back into the offices, working remotely has been, I think, much better than many people have expected. And so how can we create workplace flexibilities for museum staff and allow us to work better and more collaboratively with people all over the world, with India and America and Uzbekistan, um, <laughs> that seems much more possible now uh, than it did before the pandemic. Yes, and the question, uh, it's maybe the fear of a museum. Will the virtual and digital museums reduce visitor football in the other museums? More virtual oh, museums. Yeah, I don't. 
I, you know what? I have zero fear about that. Um, I think we have something that you can never have on the internet, which yeah. is the ability to stand in the presence of something amazing. You know, I, so here's my story. I love sculpture and I always loved Michelangelo's David. And I had a magnet of David on my refrigerator where you could put clothes on him. And I had a poster and it was great. And then when I went to Florence and I saw the David, it was a totally different experience. Being in the presence of an object that has or historical relevance or is interesting in some way that will always, that will never be replaced by digital assets. Yeah. I really think it is a, a rising tide that this is all. Yeah, that's true. Uh, maybe we, we can take one more question, I think. Sorry. This question is from Mr. Subramanian. How do you think the future museums will cross the barrier of language and reach the unreached? Maybe the uh, developing countries, whether they can, uh, we can reach them. That's the question. Yeah. Um, so I, that's really a two part question for me. We're really thinking about multilingual um, uh, museum storytelling and with increasing technologies like QR codes that allow you to bring up things in multiple languages and translation sites that are uh, much easier and less expensive than hiring translators in 10 different languages to translate everything. Our exhibition is going to be available in five languages, I think, including Hindi. Um, and uh, and that's something we really wanted to model for the future is to make all the content available in multiple languages. And then as far as developing countries, um, I think this is where our, the idea of the virtual museum, and the digital museum comes in. And apps, you know, even in developing countries, the amount of people that have smartphones is incredibly high. So if we can reach them through mobile content, um, we can hopefully share some of the wealth and richness of our work um, with people who, who are not able to come and walk through our doors. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, many more questions, but uh, because of paucity of time, we may have to stop now. Sorry for that. That's all so, right. On behalf of uh, Vishishraya Industry and Technological Museum, U.S. Consulate General Chennai, and all the participants, the audience here, let me thank Ms. Rachel Goslins, Director AIB Simpsonian, for being with us on International Museum Day and for her splendid presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And I want to thank you for everybody's use of all the little emojis. As I've been talking, there's been waving hands and clapping and party hats, and it's been very fun to like feel encouraged as I'm talking. Um, so happy International Museum to you all. I hope to come visit your museums. I've spent um, quite please. a bit of time in India. I love it. I want to come back please. when everybody can travel. Please, please do come. <laughs> in November 2021, you are all invited for a VIP tour of our Futures exhibition if you're in sure, Washington. Sure. Thanks for that. All right. Let me thank the team from U.S. Consulate General Chennai, especially Ms. Brinda Jayakal, Public en Engagement Specialist, for collaborating with Vishesha Museum in organizing the program and helping us in inviting Muslims to the program. Let me thank all the participants profusely for joining us. Thanks to Ms. Sadhana, Director of Vishwajaraya Museum, who made this program possible. My sincere thanks to all my colleagues at the museum who worked for the success of the program. Thank you all. With this, uh, we are closing now. Thanks. Thank you so much.